Hello, this is Michael Canadas with the Grovian Doll Museum in Pacific Grove, California. Today we have a special presentation for our virtual doll conventioneers. Over 45 years ago, I was treated to a day at the Tanamont Theater in Carmel Valley, California. In that little jewel box of a theater, a gentleman by the name of Mr. George Stewart opened up the world to everyone in the audience with one of his historic monologues. Basically, his historic monologues are lectures, but lectures that are enjoyable and captivating. And he certainly captivated me and the rest of the audience. At the end of his presentation, he received an ovation. The ovation was not just for his words. The ovation was also for his figures. Mr. Stewart created visual aids to help tell his stories, historic figures. They were second to none then, and they are second to none now. It gives us great pleasure to present to you Mr. George Stewart.
Well, it was a holdover from my inspiration uh, as a youngster receiving a marionette, and then that stewed in my brain, I guess, for almost 10 years before I made my first effort at a articulated uh, figurine, and uh, I made two of them at that time. And they, uh, they were enough of an inspiration to keep going another 10 years later when I picked it up and made a profession out of it. Well, the whole purpose of the figures after 59 was to illustrate the monologues. I'm a monologist, as they say, and uh, I made uh, a monologue around uh, eight or nine or ten figures each season for um, a long time. What I was looking for in the 1970s was a safe place for the figures when I was no longer using them or no longer functioning. And the Museum of Ventura County assumed that responsibility and there were around 200 figures in the beginning of their collection. And that's uh, gone to some 300 now. These dolls are toys for little girls. I am obviously not a little girl, and uh, I've never had any interest in dolls, not once, ever. But I did have an interest in a marionette as a child, and that was what inspired me to do the historical figures later on. And my effort is based on doing portraits of people from the past and trying to be accurate in those portraits. The fact that they are small scale uh, is somewhat of a jar to the official art market in this country because our culture is based on size. We're all size uh, fixative or uh, fixated. And so if you do something small that moves, well, you know, men don't understand. So we have a very limited vocabulary. And they are figurines. They're small-scale figurative sculptures in a mixed media with articulation. That's what they are. They're not dolls. So it's difficult for anybody to comprehend that because we have a limited vocabulary in this country. But we're learning. When I began producing historical figures for the monologues, which is the purpose of doing them, is making figures for illustrate the monologues. Who was a supporter? Well, I've had a number of people throughout my life who were uh, generous supporters in that they did not discourage me and they were supportive sometimes materially and sometimes uh, psychologically and sometimes partners. But uh, there have been a number. Mr. Becker is sitting here at the moment. He's a business partner of a number of years. And uh, out of the blue, he has taken an interest in the collection. It's been very consistent and long-lasting. I consider him a supporter. But if you go back in the ancient times, of course, there was a member of my extended family early on. I won't say who or how. And over the years, there have been a couple of other people who are selflessly interested. It's very, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I think uh, we're all creative. Uh, it's a matter of how our creative energy is directed and some children, certainly today, are not very well directed toward their innate creative instinct. They're, they're slotted by helicopter parents and all that sort of thing, so they don't really have a chance to have a hands-on creativity. This will this will come back eventually because the children are frustrated. That's why we have so much problem with our youngsters. But in, uh, when I was growing up, I, my parents were very intense on my having an education. That was the thing we did. And uh, simply because I was dyslexic, I, I didn't function well in school. But I had an inclination to be creative. And that was encouraged by at least one member of the family, and so I, I was able to emphasize that combination of their support and my creative interests. 
I didn't succeed in any of the uh, so-called acceptable career directions. Um, I think that this is nature uh, sort of guiding one. Uh, if people are allowed to follow their constructive inclinations um, and not forced by society, I wasn't forced. My parents obviously wanted me to be a, 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 a socialized, uh, a significant part of the community, and uh, they were all uh, from professional backgrounds or or people that didn't have to worry about those things and they just assumed I would have to follow something productive but my uh, I was very willful uh, I have a strong will I think that helps and many artists have they just are going to go the way their instincts their so-called instincts direct them no matter what the public thinks parents or otherwise and I wasn't—I was pretty willful. I was going to go ahead and do what I wanted to do. Well, that's hard to find. Um, I'm not. It's, it, it, it's sort of akin to that question: Are you happy? Are you happy? I know idiots are happy. Uh, productive people are always anguishing over their product or the skill levels and and wanting to accomplish something. I don't mean consciously saying I want to accomplish something. I mean they just do. They strive. And, and most artists I've encountered, and I don't say I've encountered a, a wide circle because my inclinations are not bohemian, but those that I have, uh, their inclinations are strong enough so they ignore social uh, norms and go ahead with what their inclinations urge them to do. I didn't have quite that freedom, but they couldn't prevent me from doing what I did want to do. So I think they've, I had a very good family, no conflicts, very civilized people, very literate, well-educated people, informed, traveled, and so on. So it wasn't a lack of sophistication on their part. I think they just thought they'd better back off. There's no point in struggling with a willful child. Never. No, they're always unfinished. And not to the degree, to the degree of accomplishment that one wants. That's the, that's the, and I think that's typical. I don't feel at all unique as a creative person. Very sort of run of the mill in that respect. I haven't met anybody who was, well, we're, we're dealing with a NIADA organization now. People all are creative is what we call them. And as I said a minute ago, everybody is creative. It's just a matter of how you implement or manifest your creativity. I could give some rather rude examples of the opposite of use of creativity, but I don't think you want to hear them. It's just that when we're creative, it's an urge. It's a strong urge. And generally, not always, um, the, the, the uh, subject person can surmount the resistance to that urgency, the parents, the society, or something. I've had um, a handful of other artists that I knew as friends over the years. And it's great fun and a great pleasure, very fulfilling, to sit beside them at their workbench and participate in what they're doing. Very interesting and a pleasure, a great pleasure. There are only two or three occasions when somebody sat beside me and helped me do my project. Usually it's a one-on thing. And I'm, you know, what can you do? I'm not a people person, number one. And, uh, there's not much that I try to do that I can share with somebody and say, well, now you do that with me. But there are some things, and that's very gratifying. I enjoy working with people if it's, you know, in reasonable proportions. It's easier, it's much easier, I think, for most artists when they get right down to the core of their product, whatever it is, to work alone. I don't, I'm not much of a believer in uh, community efforts can actually work in groups and you know the Disney Corporation has wonderful cores of collaborating artists 
And um, when I looked into that, I realized that I wasn't going to make a, a good co-worker. Uh, so it's, it's very subjective. Hell. Well, it's striving to do things that I'm not trained to do. It always has been. I don't know that it is anymore because I'm not that active now. At my age, there's uh, very little future in doing anything. And um, one's uh, energy, I think, is the main thing, depletes considerably. You know, you're working through the night sort of thing, you don't do much of that in, in the 90s. Oh, yeah. Trying to do, I uh, never did much of it because it was so demanding, so hard, is doing a well-known contemporary living person. Uh, because everybody now, a days, 19 or 2020, whatever we are, 18, everybody can see anybody numerous ways and at numerous times and angles, and we all have a vision in our heads of what that person looks like. Any kind of a contemporary person is well known because we have such, everybody, we as a population. Um, but I remember uh, when I started oil painting and portraits back when I was a teenager and then working that through for years, that uh, the hardest thing in the world was to do a portrait of somebody in a family. You know, they want a grandma's portrait and then and you, you say it's finished and the family comes and you unveil it. And invariably, somebody will say, oh my goodness, her ears weren't that big, were they? Or, or somebody else will say, well, her nose wasn't that long and pretty sensitive hands. And you think, oh, criminy. Well, the artist, and if you look at contemporary, you look at any portraiture, look at John Singer Sargent and compare him to the physical person he was painting. And you'll think, oh, I don't really look like that. Well, that's because when Sargent was painting, we weren't dependent on these god-awful photographs for everybody with their mouths open, their teeth showing, and all that mm -hmm. vulgarity. So nowadays, you get these snapshot images of people, and that's all they think of. When, when, but, but an artist who paints portraits is seeing the image of the person is an image that that artist sees not necessarily all the relatives see, but it's a work of art, and of course it isn't always exactly the way the general public sees that person, although a good painter, a good painter of portraits, is able to catch enough of the prominent features of the subject so that you say, oh, that's the nose, oh boy, those are the eyes, or something, or enough, suggests enough so that, and you usually flatter your subject someplace with all people like, in a, in a if you sit for a portrait. I don't, people don't do that anymore, so it doesn't matter. Everybody before 1940. I mean, the, the, the style of painting portraits, I think was, by World War II, was fading fast because photography had become so, such a pandemic of doing every, every person had a camera and they were clicking away so they had a record of all these smiling faces and they felt that was their record of their family. The hardest thing in the world for me to make are children or pretty young women because you have so little material to work with. You have to, you have to be careful not to even if there's a shadow and you make it look like a shadow, then everybody says, that's a wrinkle. No, it's just a badly painted shadow. So you have to be very careful. And I was never that accomplished. As a painter, I, I you know, if I had been an ace painter, I'd still be doing it. No, I haven't painted in years. I sold, but I wasn't a good portrait artist. Well, I just finished what was probably my last figure. Just finished a, a, a portrait of Xi Jinping, the president of China. A modern man's suit. The, the cut of men's clothing has changed so over the centuries. 
the same gentleman, same class, same type in 1850 was much easier to cut and frame and do because the, well, the tailoring is just com less complex and now it's very, very tight, very smooth and that's awfully hard to do in small scale simply because the fabrics are thick and heavy and stiff and you know, it's hard to find a fabric in scale. If you did it in tissue paper, I suppose it would work better, but that isn't very practical. Well, I don't know, uh, uh, but uh, uh, high-level seas and earthquake California and uh, the threat of atomic bombs from Korea, I don't know if there's any future for anything. Uh, I'm not hopeless. I don't, I'm not a hopeless person, contrary to everybody's assumption, because I'm, they misunderstand uh, critical attitudes as being uh, mean and hopeless and, and unpleasant. So it's very difficult. Americans are not good with criticism. I won't speak for the French because they give it as good as they get. And the English too, they're artists with it. And the, everybody else. But Americans are not good with criticism, especially if it's personal. So you always want to be cheerful and up with them and not discourage them. And never try, and this I think is only fair in general, you do not humiliate anybody uh, that you're opposed to. You can criticize them, but you try to be a, a um, constructive critic. And I notice in the arts, when I was on the stage, uh, we had a director who just uh, absolutely slaughtered us on the dress rehearsals. The actresses were all in tears. The men were ready to kill the director. It was, but he thought he was doing a good thing and being hypercritical. Well, psychologically speaking, it isn't really that good. You have to say something good about somebody before you give them the bad news. And there's an art form in doing that, and good directors know how to do it. And you hear about it when they're not good at it. Even if their films are successful, or the plays are successful, they're not particularly f fondly s sought out. Although I'm not saying fondness is important in a director. You have to have a director that directs. But if they're merciless in their criticism, uh, it's not helpful. It reduces everybody's, you can't attack a man or woman's ego and then get a good show out of them. Well, I try to accept it for what it is, that I'm probably pretty awful at what I'm doing or they wouldn't say so. Shape up, Stuart, do a better job. I'm not very virtuous in this. I probably, my feelings get hurt too, but I don't blubber about it. I think being an acting student is awfully good for, well, that's what young performers all go through acting school. You're reduced to tears over the way the teacher treats you. It's a part of it. You get used to that part. If you're sensible, you get used to it. If you're not sensible and say boo-hoo to every time anybody says, well, you, you know, you gained a little weight, haven't you? Oh, oh boo-hoo. No, no, no. You get a little bit, lose the weight. It's a good question. It's about half and half. Uh, I've done a lot of studies of people who are complete shits, uh, historically. Awful people, we call them. We, they're our most popular representations in the museum. We have a really awful people show, and they just love it. We all love to see the villains. So they're fun to do, and, and we try to do accurate figures. We don't try to do caricatures. When I first started out, I, I noticed when I look back on things, there were little caricatures, and we got rid of all that. Uh, I was taught never to, well, never is the wrong word. Uh, you know what Tussauds waxes are? Well, they're famous waxworks in London. Well, I was taught by them that a good portrait never shows the teeth, smiling faces, that sort of thing. You just don't do it. Uh, traditional, you never see a good portrait with smiling. You see some very commonplace portraits today because people don't really follow any rules. They just, you know, they're trying to emulate. Well, I don't know what they're trying to do, but it's ugly. So uh, I took that to heart. And unless the mouth was open for a reason and or something that animated in pain and agony or something like that, 
you try to show it, uh, the, the best you do is show a smile, but never a grin, the teeth are showing. Uh, that's one of those little rules of portrait painting that was traditional. Movies, plays, almost everything is based on loving the hero and liking the villain. So monstrous. Sure, we love a monster. So it's, it's fun to have a real... Trouble is, history is not filled with... Hitler wasn't a, an ugly man. Uh, he was a monster interiorly, perhaps, but not in Stalin, too, you know. Uh, he did dreadful things worse than Hitler. But uh, he looks like somebody's uncle, and, you know. If you make... That was sort of the fun for me, to have uh, an attractive portrait of somebody who was a real monster. And talk about it, and the audience says, oh! That's good. That's fun. That's theater. It's the best fun to have a, somebody on stage being very elegant and suave and handsome and turn them into a monster. So it's fun. It's theater. Well, I can't think of any particular one. I, I, when I was, I had the misfortune of teaching school a couple of times. Uh, that's what people who have no talents do. They go into a boarding school and teach school. That's too bad, but they don't, they're not accredited. And I wasn't. And um, I remember one case where I was just the worst sort of a teacher. I learned as I went along. Uh, and it, it nearly came to a lawsuit for the school to be sued over this awful teacher who was mistreating the children. Well, by the end of the semester, I had learned my lesson, and the same parents were saying, well, where is this man going next? I want to send the kid there. Well, you know, you learn, and you try not to uh, bully children, certainly. Get a paying job. I think everybody in this country is saddled with the fact of economics. You don't make money on average in the arts. Now, there'll be some people who, through one way or another, we could go into that for hours, are able to make a wonderful career out of art, so-called art, but not many. And uh, I think it's a good idea uh, uh, not to crush the spirit of the youngster when you see that he or she is creative beyond average or whatever, but demonstrate something that you can see, well, Susie really would like to be, you know, doing whatever. But make it a balance so that they have a time and a, an environment for cultivating their creative side, as well as seeing to it that they have the machinery to enter our society, the tools, I guess is the right word. And, and if you can, and discover early their, their weak spots and try to help them get through. The things you have to help them with are not art. Uh, just don't stop them in art. They'll find their way in art. But in academic studies, I think you, some of us need a lot of understanding and patience because uh, we're slow. Don't get it right off. And dyslexia, as I pointed out in the talk, was something we never heard of when I was growing up. So the fact that I was severely dyslexic, they just thought I was stupid. Well, you know, whatever, what were they to think? Never. No, it was a, I feel this. A, 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 some people, if you ask them, would they do it all over again, meaning their lives, would say, no, no, I just, it was wonderful. Well, that's great. They're comfortable in their skins and they feel that they've done the right thing. They're comfortable. You have to be comfortable to, to have any kind of ease of mind. I won't say they're happy. Happiness is for idiots. But if you feel that you've somehow missed the boat and uh, you haven't done awfully well, uh, then it, it would be too bad that they didn't learn something very practical early in life that could carry them through, something that the public generally would need. A lawyer would be good. Uh, the, the, uh, there are all kinds of, of uh, employments that people will need for a, a long time before uh, the, uh, the digital age overcomes us all and we're simply vegetables. But uh, 
don't you think, Mr. Baker? There, you need to learn a practical thing. Mm -hmm. But on the, I won't. I wouldn't say crush the arts. We do all the time. This organization, where they came to it in midlife, after they, the children are up and are gone, then then they're free to women. I'm talking about uh, free to, and they get rid of the idiot husband. Then then they have time and the true spirits frequently come blossoming out. More power to them. So is religion. Um, I think the any culture that you read about is probably remembered by the creative culture part, not the warfare culture part necessarily, although that's the second thing. Uh, uh, any, any kind of a, a cultural norm for them that carries through the centuries is memorable. And, and that's too general, but I don't know how else to express it. But um, I think of all the, the wonderful things men and women have created over the centuries that have been destroyed by uh, usually a male-dominated culture where uh, men's worst instincts were allowed to allow free play. I mean, it starts with men with muscle, and it graduates with two men with power to control other muscle, and so on. And, and women uh, are uh, have come and gone, for unfortunately, infrequently in in cultures of power. There have been in the ancient times some Amazonian cultures, but not very many. And we've, for centuries, allowed men to become the dominant gender. And that's changing somewhat. We'll see where it goes. This is a young history. We're just barely scratching the surface, but I think women today are showing much more ability to do anything. And the only thing about it is we, we some of us crank and say, well, if the women are in control, it'd be all right. Well. Golda Meir was a, a very able woman, but she was an absolute brute in doing her politics. So, you know, she, did, no man could compare with her or any, you know, say she was weak in any way. She was a strong person. Margaret Thatcher, for all her terrible policies, was a strong person and able to govern badly, if your point of view is liberal. And so on. So you know, women in power might not be any improvement on things, but I have a feeling there is something glandularly different. Is that too much a stretch? I think motherhood would make a big difference. If men had babies or were forced to have children or whatever you want to call it, there would be a lot of equity. But that isn't the case yet. No, no, maybe men will be re reconfigured to have babies. I think they'd be a lot better if they knew what it was. paying off the mortuary fee. At my age, nothing. I'm, I'm too old to do anything now. Nobody yeah. wants a speaker that's 90 years old. These were kindly people who all share, we all share the same uh, creative impetus, I'd say. And uh, I, I, I'm, without being just blitheringly general, I'm inclined to believe people who actually create things with their own hands are a bit more forgiving than people who never create anything with their own hands. There's a certain simpatico, if that's fair, among those who are craftspersons and they admire each other's crafts and so on. So they were a good audience and and very forgiving. <laughs> I'm not exactly a cuddly. My pleasure entirely. Thank you.